Welcome to the HC Insider Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the commodities sector and the people within it. I'm your host, Paul Chapman. Today we are talking about the impact of AI on forecasting and what it means for the commodity trading desks of the future. What are the nascent tools today? What are they capable of that prior tools aren't? What are the definitions around artificial intelligence and the models that they use? And what does it mean for talent? And what does it mean for data? And what does it mean for costs? Our guest is Felipe Elink Sherman. A former oil trader at Gunvor, Felipe is now the CEO and founder of Sparta Commodities, an intelligence and forecasting company for the commodities sector headquartered in Geneva. Also, we have our next HC Insider podcast live event coming up on April 16th in Geneva to celebrate the launch of HC Group's office there to discuss the future of Switzerland as a commodities trading hub. The event starts at 6.30 with a live panel recording and then cocktails and networking afterwards. The event's free, but is RSVP only and seats are limited. I'll put links in the show notes for those who wish to attend. As always, you can really support the show by leaving us a positive review on the platform you're listening on, especially a written review on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. It really does help support us. And as always, I hope you enjoy the episode. Felipe, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, so we're talking the impact of AI, artificial intelligence, on forecasting. And this is almost a a part two to the episode we did with Matteo Mazzoni on the challenges of forecasting in what is now a very volatile world for commodities and many more factors outside the sector are impacting it. Um, I guess let's I'd love to get from you kind of an overview of kind of where we are at the moment, what current the typical tools a trading desk uses, the typical tools that data analytics providers provide, and then we can build up to how that is rapidly transforming and being empowered by new technologies such as AI. Yeah, obviously. Um, so right now, uh, I think you can make a distinction between different types of trading companies. So hedge funds and banks are probably the most sophisticated They were the first ones to ingest uh, various data sources into data lakes and use uh, uh, more sophisticated tools like Spark or Kafka to be able to understand that information, interpret it, and put in uh, algorithmic trading strategies around that. But then, uh, but that's not the case for all of the hedge funds, by the way. But uh, you then have other companies like the trading houses that historically were much more merchant type traders and uh, using essentially Excel. And they have been transitioning over the last, I would say, four or five years into uh, what we call a hedge fundization of the market, if you want, and following the best practices of these hedge funds and banks. They rely essentially on uh, other other tools like uh, Refinitiv, Bloomberg, or Kepler, or Texa, and hopefully a bit more on Sparta for uh, their data ingestion and and communication with data. But they're doing a tremendous amount of work in uh, setting up these data lakes and uh, being able to visualize all of their internal data, which is quite vast, using Power BI tools and things like that. But the vast majority of the market, I would say, is still pretty much stuck with Excel. And that's the way they consume the data, I would say. So, you know, simple regressions and so forth on Excel. You mentioned Spark and Kafka. Can you give us some sense of what those tools do? I think that will set us up nicely to differentiate them from AI. We'll move on to that next. But, you know, the best in class, those hedge funds and banks who have got a more sophisticated approach to data. How are their tools different to, say, the merchants that you mentioned? Well, I would say, first of all, it's not only about the tools, but it's also about the mindset. They were the first ones to understand the, the importance of data and structured data. Tools like Kafka allow you to, you know, str- you know, it's a streaming tool uh, for data and Spark is much more a tool used in big data analysis. Uh, I'm actually not a technical guy, so I wouldn't be able to give you much more of a detail, but uh, I think that the main thing is understanding the importance of data and uh, how uh, different alternative data sets can influence your decision making. And I think that comes from the top and understanding that is even more important than the tools itself. 
AI is, is described to lots of things because it's, you know, it's part fashionable, part uh, increases multiples and so forth. Can you can you help us understand, you know, at a high level what AI is and then what it isn't in and and give us that sort of delineation between how the current tools are not really AI. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, now since uh, ChatGPT and OpenAI, everyone is talking about AI again. But it is a phenomenon that has happened. You know, uh, you know, it's a it's a trend that we've seen for the, over the last 30, 40 years. And what we're talking when people talk about AI right now, they're referring to the Gen AI, which is essentially these foundation models like Mistral. Uh, OpenAI, Llama, etc. But there are many different types of AI. You have machine learning. So those are algorithms that analyze historical data to identify patterns and make predictions. They, you know, supervise, it's basically supervised learning techniques uh, like regressions uh, that are commonly used for forecasting in capital markets. You also have deep learning, which is a subset of machine learning, and it employs neural networks with multiple layers to extract features from data. This deep learning allows you to capture complex patterns and relationships in the financial data. So it's like machine learning, but uh, with different layers. You also have natural language processing, which again has been used for many years already. And uh, it enables you to uh, extract uh, and well, analyze textual data from news articles, social media, financial reports. This has been used recently for sentiment analysis. And finally, you also have reinforcement learning. And those are algorithms that learn optimal decision-making strategies uh, through trial and error. So reinforcement learning can be used to optimize trading strategies or portfolio management. So these are the sort of more traditional kind of AIs. And they're traditionally a bit more narrow in scope, uh, focusing on specific tasks or domain. Like, for example, machine learning models are trained to perform tasks like classification, regressions, clustering uh, of historical data. Whereas Gen AI, which is what we're seeing right now, the, uh, the idea is to, it, it aims to mimic human-like intelligence across a diverse um, tasks and domains. It has the potential to understand and to reason about complex systems, and uh, it can adapt to new environments and uh, it can generalize knowledge across different domains. So, you know, it's a it's a new set of AI, but AI has been there and has been used for the last 30 years. Just so I understand, so generative AI is essentially the idea or the concept is you can take all those different, those four categories of types of models, and essentially they'd all be running at once within this sort of meta, yeah. meta AI program. So you are able to do the reinforcement learning, the sentiment analysis, you know, that's sort of the, the more traditional machine learning and deep learning pieces. And then you're also layering on decision making that mimics what a, a human could do. More or less, yes. I, I think that's a good summary. I, again, I'm not, um, I've, I've been learning about AI recently over the last years. So I wouldn't be able to give you a, a technical answer in terms of does it encompass all of the four or it's, or it's a different way of approaching the subject but it definitely has a wider scope and it allows you to interpret and to understand and reason with the data sets, if you want. Uh, whereas uh, a machine learning is much more deterministic. If this, then that, if you want, you know. So, so obviously it's much more complex and it adds this extra layer of reason. Because one of the challenges, as we highlighted in our previous episode, is, of course, with all of these models, you're relying on historical data sets. And those data sets become less valid the more volatile the world ha becomes the more events happen the more the geopolitical situation it becomes less stable um, i can certainly see an argument for where bringing in that sentiment mm. analysis with natural language processing you know hey we're going to troll twitter or whatever it might be and oh look it looks like this country is becoming potentially at more at risk for for dis political disruption etc does gen ai try how does it can it get around that challenge or are we always based on you know this is you know chat gpt is it doesn't look past a, a couple of years ago i mean doesn't look forward of a couple of years ago and it's still just relying on what data is out there yeah that's the thing it's still relying on historical data now that historical data depends on what historical data you're using you know uh, and that's the whole point uh, if you are 
a trading company, a, you know, a traditional trading company, you're not using sentiment analysis in your decision making. What you're, you know, these these companies like Gunboard, Trafigura, and all that, they generally don't trade flat price, or they do sometimes, but the reason for that is because you cannot control the flat price because it is determined by external factors w- beyond your control, like OPEC decisions or or wars or things like that. So generally, they have always traded on differentials or you know like spreads, time spreads, or geographical spreads, and things like that, which is something you can control. And the reason I say this is that despite the fact that you've had all of these macro events in the la- in the recent years. The, the historical data sets, if you're using the right ones, can still be quite applicable in order for you to forecast. But if you're trading on a, on a flat price basis, and I know that in agriculture, that's generally the case, then yes, indeed, these uh, macro movements have a bigger impact. So again, you know, Gen AI is not solving the problem of being able to avoid historical data. You still need to do it. But it, it's a, it's also a matter of which data you use for your trading decisions. Yeah, fascinating. Okay, and where are we today? We can talk about the future and what impact this would have, which some of that's unknowable because we don't know how these technologies are necessarily going to develop, but we can put some pretty good ideas around it. But what are the emergent uses today? Is, is this again, are we seeing those hedge funds and trading houses, sorry, the hedge funds and the banks really lean into this cutting edge technology, partnering with the various, you know, emergent groups out there like OpenAI to really tackle this? I mean, or is it still very much nascent? I think that everyone is still figuring out how to use this. And uh, there's an important factor to take into account is that uh, Gen AI is generally inferring, uh, you know, it's the way OpenAI works is that it will anticipate what the next word would be based on historical context, if you want. So it's a, an inference model. Similarly, when you know you ask, uh, you've seen probably OpenAI, the Sora videos, you know, where you ask a, a prompt to make a video of a puppy in the snow and things like that. In that context, uh, hallucination, so essentially you ask for a puppy in the snow and it gives you a puppy in, I don't know, in, in a field, and that hallucination can actually be considered a feature. Whereas in capital markets, it's uh, it's a bug. You cannot, you know, you really need to have deterministic data. So I, I think that we're still, at least in, in our markets, in capital markets, where the application layer in terms of being able to predict uh, uh, on a much more accurate way uh, using Gen AI is still a bit dangerous. You know, when we talk to, here at Sparta, we're talking with a different kind of foundation models and we're testing them. We realize that, uh, the technology is, there, is not there yet for our purposes or for the trading purposes. I would imagine that all of these banks, hedge funds, but also the trading houses and the oil majors are also exploring this. But again, it's where the technology is not yet sufficiently reliable for you to you know, make deterministic trades around it. So in other words, still at the moment, you, you need the, the human trader there to be able to say execute or not. And, yes. and the judgment lies at the human level, not the at the the algorithm level. Yeah, correct. I mean, definitely, definitely. And I think that still will be the case. I think that, I mean, you know, let's not forget that uh, the banks and hedge funds in capital markets have been, you know, using algorithmic trading for the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years. So again, AI, we need to make a distinction between the different types of AI, as I mentioned before, um, and Gen AI, which is the the, you know, the new flavor right now or the new hit but in you know there have been many cases with uh, or use cases with uh, the more traditional ai tools like algorithmic trading to execute trades based on predefined criteria or you know using nlps for sentiment analysis using ai to predict uh, demand or use you know the things like things like uh, apple and uh, google mobility data Uh, weather patterns, all of these things have been used, if you want, in the past with deep learning and with machine learning. And even uh, recently, you know, for example, uh, IceChat uh, and other tools are able to extract uh, uh, using a a national language processing to be able to extract uh, data from the chats, uh, unstructured data, and convert that into a structured table with the latest bids or the latest offers and things like that. So there's been a lot of use cases already 
It's just that um, the Gen AI, if you want, are all these foundation models. Everyone is exploring it, but I wouldn't say you can still you can use them uh, de- deterministically. Yeah, which is which is fascinating, right? Because so what we have seen over the last ten years is the shrinkage of the number of traders or people talent required in a trading organization as many functions have become automated some have become regulated away like the old mid-marketing at banks and so forth Mm. and you know capturing technology and automation to to lower costs and you know alongside that as well we should note from a talent landscape side you know what i can talk to is that also the number of organizations that are trading have shrunk as well right we've we've seen a shrinkage in the number of merchants the number of of trade houses banks and so forth this this poses a bit of a challenge, right? If you're sat in the C-suite, and we're already, I guess, as a, as a search firm, the beneficiary of this, there's lots of talent go- hiring going on in, in the technology piece. In fact, our tech practice is one of the fastest growing ones. Mm. But you're, you're, you're sort of sat, these things are really expensive. We, we can see the benefits, right? Which would be accuracy of, of forecasting, like you said, and, you know, and that's differentiated to your competitors because you've got better models and uh, better data. Um, presumably, and and also speed as well, right? The speed at which you can get to that decision point. But I mean, this is incredibly costly, right? If everyone is going to try and explore these emergent technologies in AI, I mean, uh, you know, these these people are sought after by multiple industries. You know, they are in them of themselves expensive. The infrastructure that they need is expensive. I mean, can you just give us some sense of kind of, you know, like? There's a bit of an arms race going on, I would imagine, and it's an expensive one. I mean, that's the thing, you know. So that's what, that's why, for example, Nvidia is uh, breaking all kinds of records because everyone is in this sort of all of these companies, whether it's in commodity trading, but also the big tech companies, they have a lot of cash and they need to deploy that cash, and they're sort of investing in what are the different applications. So now everyone is trying the models and figuring out what are the, what, what is the best model for my use case? Uh, how do I uh, interpret the data that I have? How can I actually make something out of it? And I don't know if you noticed, but you know there there haven't there hasn't been any kind of amazing application offers, if you want. You know you have a lot of you know these sort of uh, what's called the AI wrappers. You know essentially they take a, a chat GPT with a and they 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 you know they they add a, just a one percent with their data and they and you you ha- you can create images you can you know you can change you know your profile pictures and make them cooler and things like that. But in terms of on a business perspective, I haven't seen that many uh, applications of AI in the market. Now you're seeing that a lot in you know things that have nothing to do with commodities. No, but the other day Klarna announced that they they re- basically changed the. Uh, all of their um, support, and it's now AI, and uh, they've been able to save fifty million dollars thanks to it. So you started seeing that, but it's only the the initial phases. I think that last year was all about figuring. You know, all of these management companies had to, you know, first of all structure themselves and start hiring people. This year is all about figuring out how we apply this new technology. So we will only start seeing the application side of AI whether it's in commodities or in any other industry, over the course of end of this year, I would say, and next year. But it is it is a costly exercise because, again, uh, no one really knows what they're doing right now. The HC Insider podcast is brought to you by HC Group, a retained search, intelligence and advisory firm focused solely on the global energy and commodity sector. With six locations across Asia, Europe, and the Americas, and over 50 consultants. To find out more, go to our website, hcgroup.global. There, you can also sign up for our HC Insider content for more interviews and white papers on relevant trends and talent impacts in the commodities world. Again, it comes back to those challenging decisions where they're actually, okay, well, we aren't going to invest in in quotes AI today you know we're going to keep trying to make sure that we're collecting our data treating that as a strategic asset and and using it in best practice with the tools we've got now and we'll wait to see which technologies emerge and then go after them it is a I can imagine that's a real challenge 
Yeah, no, it's, uh, I mean, the most important thing is, you know, right now when it comes to the application layer side, I mean, right now you're going to have these foundation models that are going to dominate in the same way that uh, AWS and Google and, and Azure are dominating the cloud space. So essentially Llama, the open models are going to, and uh, Mistral, et cetera, with OpenAI are going to dominate that foundation level. And and then the question is, how do we apply this, you know? and and that requires, and the key for that application is proprietary data. So if you do have proprietary data, then you can start using those foundation models to extract intelligence, to extract uh, understanding and, and reason, if you want, from your own proprietary data that will set you uh, apart from the rest of the market. Because if the rest of the market only is using you know, third-party data that is available, then you don't have that extra edge. So I would say the key thing right now is for all the trading companies and all that is to structure themselves, you know, and have the right talent and the right talent. Everyone is sort of, oh, we need data scientists. But the first thing you need is actually data engineers, moving everything into data lakes, having the data clean, structured, accessible, so that the data scientists can actually start extracting value out of it. So I would say that the first thing you need to do or any company would needs to do is very much work on the data engineering side of things and setting up the basis for the data extraction and manipulation of it. Yeah, yeah, that's fascinating. I'd, I'd almost argue that before your data engineers and your data scientists and, and what we've been doing a lot of on the leadership side is right at the very top, you need commercial leadership who understands the power of the data that they might have. Right, this idea that if you know, yes. if only you knew what you knew, so Absolutely. to speak, and and that's fascinating because one of the things that we're seeing at the moment is lots of physical participants in the supply chain, whether they are producers, majors, refiners, and some are much further on the curve on this. Some are very much behind. Are all looking to explore how they can optimize their trading and marketing in in this volatile world and in a world of energy transition. And they have extraordinary amounts of proprietary data that, you know, whether it's a pipeline company or whatever it might be, that depending on their level of sophistication, they're not actually even thinking of as a, as a strategic asset. So it's yes. probably also getting that leadership in place to say, hey, we have a lot of information here. And, and this kind of moves us towards the future where actually we might see a very different trading desk in the future, but I don't want to get there quite yet. I fully agree. I mean, it, it starts from the top down. I mean... Um, these trading houses, and what you see when I talk to, what I see when I talk to some of the management of these teams is, is that uh, they're all talking about AI, but they, they don't really understand what AI means and what are the applications and all of that. And so the, the first thing is understanding that, you know, rubbish in, rubbish out. If you don't have structured, clean, accessible data, and if everything is scattered across multiple spreadsheets and things like that, then you do have that proprietary, vast amounts of proprietary data, but it's not really accessible, you know? So that mindset has to shift and they need to move. And you have a lot of companies that are doing it, but, you know, it, it funny enough, it, it almost takes more time for that management shift than it takes to actually execute on the strategy. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And that we, we see that as well, right? Knowing what questions to ask and then, you know, finding individuals who can translate the, the needs into, into strategy. Before we sort of move on to what this means in, in 10 years or something, does this signal a potential fundamental shift in power? Because for the most part, hedge funds and the banks, in fact, let's, let's put banks aside because they see flow through their customers. But hedge funds have obviously built an edge in their ability to collect and consume data and turn that into actionable trades, right? You could argue, though, that for the most part, they're relying on third party data sets, you know, they don't have any in, in endogenous data themselves, so to speak. In the long term, does this trend ultimately put hedge funds at a severe disadvantage if they have not yet built up a, a sort of insurmountable moat around themselves in terms of the, the, you know, the amount of data and model? You know, I'm thinking of like a Citadel who've been doing this for t 20 years or so. Mm. You know, in 10 years time, does it really give the edge back to the physical players if they get this piece right? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I would say that in the short term, because they already had this mindset shift and they are already 
storing and communicating with the data appropriately, uh, they have the edge right now because it's just about ingesting new data sets and uh, ingesting alternative data sets or even with the use of AI or Gen AI being able to access you know, with OpenAI you can, or, or, or Grok or all these things, you can, you can access uh, the entire internet if you want as a data set. No? So they have that advantage because of the mentality if you want. Now, as I said, it's all about the proprietary data. And it's probably one of the technologies over the last years that probably benefits more the incumbent rather than the new one. So the big trading houses and the oil majors, you know, they have this huge data set. But they first need to structure it, clean it, and make it accessible. And then maybe then they will have this uh, competitive advantage, as you're mentioning. But I would say in the short term, it still benefits the hedge funds uh, and banks, if you will. OK, so looking towards the future, I remember having a conversation with an individual, at one of the, the management consultancies 10 years ago, who was describing to me, a particular oil major with a, a huge global LNG business and a fleet and so forth, you should be able to, ultimately, if you've got a large system like that, and you know prices at various ports, you know contract details, and you know you know things like the draft capability of the various ports and everything, you should be able to, with all that set up, basically just let loose an AI system to just go ahead and make the most optimal decisions. And then you've got a a human there in the case of an event, right, that needs to have an intervention. Hey, this has happened and so forth. Can we reroute or whatever? Is that where it's going, do you think? I mean, what does that mean for the trading desk of the future where you do get your data structured, cleaned, you've got proprietary data, and you have a large system that you can just you know, the model starts actually making the decision and the trading role, so to speak, the human intervention over time decreases to the point where it's just an oversight function. Yeah, I would say there's a lot of applications that uh, are there to come and they're quite fascinating and and, and honestly, I, I find them super exciting. First of all, around predictive analytics and forecasting. So using, you know, once the technology is there, you can start using Gen AI to have uh, to enhance the algorithmic trading models that you currently use, you would have this proprietary automated portfolio management, as you're describing, an unsupervised AI-driven portfolio management system that could dynamically adjust the uh, asset allocations and um, and positions based on market conditions, risk tolerance, etc. For me, one of the most fascinating ones is going to be the use of the chat uh, for conversational AI decision support. So think about it this way, you will have these prompts that will allow you to communicate with the data in a very different way. And again, right now, everything is is consumed through these platforms. But in the future, perhaps you will be able to ask uh, the, the AI, um, you know, based on your own data sets. And, and, you know, these oil majors have so many vast data sets that they can communicate with. And you will be able to say, OK, what was the last time that the price was here? Where what was the impact that that price had on something else? What was the correlation and things like that? You know, you would be able to ask these kind of questions and even create your own charts and, and dashboards and things like that. Because as you've seen, you can with a prompt you can generate a video. You will be able to also generate all kinds of charts, etc. Internally, there's also the application in terms of risk management and scenario analysis. You know, the ability to simulate various market scenarios and test the what-if scenarios on a much more granular basis. You know? So, I, I mean, there's so many different applications that are so fascinating that uh, I do believe that this is going to be transforming the way people trade, the way they communicate with data, the way they make decisions ultimately. But again, before that, and I think that you know that's the thing is that everyone gets very excited, but I would say that before that, you also need to Think about what kind of data do you want in these models? You know, so what we see in terms of the demand of data is much more granularity. You know, so now that you can communicate and you can you have the ability to extract uh, insights from vast amounts of data in almost real time, you want to be able to have that granularity that would give you that uh, sensitivity of uh, one market versus the other. You want to start moving not just raw data, but you want to start having historical data sets of output data. So refining margins, arbitrage margins, and landed prices or whatever. So what we see is that there's more and more demand for 
forecast data, not just uh, so historical forecasted data, so that you can then backtest that and create systematic trading opportunities. And you want to be able to access that in real time, historically, not in batches once a day, but you want to be able to see the most recent, you know, second by second information. So the key right now, I would say, is, is to have that those data sets and then start applying at the same time the different ways of communicating with the data in the future. I mean, if we take just a couple of key roles on the trading floor, it's fascinating to kind of think about how those roles would change. Let's take a trader, and obviously you were, you know, spent a substantial part of your career as an oil trader at one of those trading houses at Gunball. The trader of, when you were sort of doing your aptitude testing to become a trader, you know, people are looking for speed of, of decision-making, calculation, commerciality, you know what I mean? It's, it's that ability to sort of figure out the odds pretty quickly and typically make very good poker players, for example. Yeah. All of that skill set, though, you would argue, is now going to be done by a computer, right? And, and I'm, I know I'm sort of taking this to sort of the nth degree, but if I remember one of my university professors back in the day talking about being on a flight and, and a kid next to him proudly saying that he could calculate any any sum to the fifth decimal point within th two seconds. And the professor was like, well, you know, great, but have you heard of a calculator? You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's kind of what in, in 10 years time, the you could argue that the fundamental role of a, of a trader will have shifted dramatically. And those things that we look for them in the past are now just commoditized skill sets to, to, to pun. And secondly, like, you know, look at um, a market risk expert. At some point, all of that, it, it always has been calculated by regressions, but the key was being able to do those regressions. Suddenly, market risk data is going to be an output of, of, of these models and, and presumably not require human, so to speak. I mean, can you just, I, I, you know, I just find it kind of a fascinating discussion and, yeah. and, and probably a bit overwrought, but you know, what do you think of the skill sets in 10 years that will form a trading floor? Yeah, no, it's uh, it's definitely going to be different, and um, and we already see that in the market right now. When when I started trading, it didn't really matter whether you had a master's degree, if you went to Oxford or Cambridge or anything like that. You know, you had a lot of traders that that were merchant type traders. They would pick up a flight, go to random places in the world, and and do deals. You know, it was very much that kind of attitude. And you know, over the last years, we're seeing more and more of these. Uh, data-oriented uh, decision-making, if you want, or people that are able to communicate and understand data. But, I mean, I, don't, I really don't know where, how this is going to end up. I, I do believe that this is a tool that would enhance traders, but it will not replace traders. You know, you see the, the, in capital markets and equities and bonds, you know, probably they are 15 years in advance relative to commodities in the way they use technology and data. They have been using, you know, speed trading and algorithmic trading for the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years. But you still also have these value traders that have a different positioning in the market. They hold positions for a long time. They trade in a different way. So I think that you can coexist and it will just enhance the way you trade and it will just make it faster. I think that the, the main thing is just going to be the 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 speed of decision making uh, the impact is going to be under the speed of decision making because you you know right now if you imagine oh, you you want to um there's a refinery that shuts down the trader would ask the analyst okay well tell me what is the impact and then he will need to run the model and and maybe he can give an answer you know if you're fast enough three or four hours later or maybe one or two days later depending on the company but uh, with AI, you will be able to have that information immediately. You will be able to run the model and it will give you the answer within seconds. So I think that you will still want to have a trader, a supervisor, if you want, even if you have algorithmic uh, trading capabilities, but you still have to supervise. And as you said in your, in your previous uh, podcast, uh, you know, the volatility in the market uh, will, you cannot base yourself, you know, you, you will always be basing yourself on historical data sets. But that history will change depending on the new supply and demand balances and wars and things like that. So you always need to supervise it. So again, I think it's going to enhance the capabilities. It's going to allow people to trade faster. And ultimately, it will also allow more market participants to participate um, because you will have this accessibility of data and, um, 
and the ability to interpret it and uh, to make positions uh, with more knowledge, if you want. So that will probably attract more and more. And we see it. We see it that you were mentioning before that banks are, you know, no longer there, but actually they're all coming back. And, you know, there's hedge funds don't, you know, they, they, they can't get enough traders, you know, so everyone is coming back into commodities. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I've got to be careful what I say here, but, you know, we're supporting a number of organizations, you know, large strategics on their long range plans for trading. Mm. And it's fascinating to me, there are some within that cohort that are firmly set on the, the, the future desk, you know, the future trading desk is going to look very different. And we're building towards that and, and some that are recreating what they knew from their previous organizations. And, you know, that is tricky, right? Because you, you kind of need the historical setup to trade today mm. and get trading. But the future trading is going to look very different. You're going to have instead of, you know, arguably, you're going to have far more analysts than you are traders you're going to have far fewer of you know and actually your trade is probably trending towards more of an origination role right than they are actually a yeah you know a, a, a true trading role uh, where they are out there getting the longer term deals that support the the system um, but anyway enough of that uh, it'd be it would it'd be great and this has been really fascinating and i think you know probably leave us all with a food for thought how how does sparta position itself within that you know what is it that you guys do and what is it that you're doing to make yourself match fit for today, but also that future outlook for commodities trading? When we started Sparta at the time, um, the traders were essentially trading in the same way that they were 20 years ago. They had the same tools and it was very unstructured, very slow, and the market was going at a much faster pace and the decision-making was not fast enough. So the first idea was to stream, streamline the capturing of data and to be able to provide traders with uh, all of the different data points or price points in real time. And once we did that, then the next step was to calculate the value that you can generate out of that price. For us, trading is all about uh, making decisions by identifying the gap between price and value. So essentially what we do is we provide all of the prices and then we automatically calculate on a live basis, what are the value generators, uh, arbitrage margins, blending margins, refining margins, and things like that. And by doing so, then you can see what is the price and you can see what is the value of that price and determine whether it's undervalued or overvalued. In essence, we are creating a digital twin of the market and allowing people to then speed up their decision making process, have a global view of what's going on in the market and obviously gain an edge. And going forward, the why this is important in the age of AI is because we're creating that proprietary data set and it's extremely granular. And it's forward looking, you know, we're constantly forecasting the market. And what we're seeing now with customers is that they're taking our historical data set. Admittedly, it's not, uh, you know, ideally we would love to have 10 years worth of history. We only have three or four, but that is being used to then backtest those forecasts versus the actuals. And uh, that actually will have a tremendous amount of impact as people transition into this systematic and algorithmic kind of trading. So. This is a technology that would benefit the incumbents, but it will also benefit the, the, the new companies that have a proprietary data set. And, and that data set uh, can be used in this uh, future wave of um, algorithmic trading. Fantastic. Well, as I said, it's been a really interesting discussion. You know, maybe we can have you back on, Felipe, in a, in a couple, of, uh, couple of years or a year's time and, and see how this is trending, because I think it is such a key topic that impacts obviously both our world in talent, but also the nature and function of the commodity markets themselves. And I know that people, uh, I think this episode will have gone out after it, I assume, but uh, I know you, you're talking on this topic at the FT Commodity Summit uh, in early April, so I'm sure we'll get the chance to, to hear your views again there. Fantastic. Yeah, no, no, I, I, it's going to be fascinating to see. I think that we're all expecting it to be much faster than it will actually be. Uh, I, I don't think the transition will be that fast, if you want, particularly in an industry like commodity trading that culturally has always been very secretive. But yeah, I think we're definitely in a transition phase. This is a transmor transformative technology. And um, I don't know if it's in two years, five or 10, but it's going to definitely change the talent pool and also the way that people communicate and trade and make decisions. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating. Thanks again, Felipe. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. 
If you enjoyed this episode and want to support the show, please give us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. To find out more about HC Insider and HC Group, a search and advisory firm dedicated to the commodity markets, visit our website at www.hcgroup.global. There you can find out more about our services and our offices around the world. There you can also find more content from interviews to insight pieces to more podcasts focused on the commodity value chains. Thanks again for listening.